if someone was to uh, ask you the story of your life, then for many of us, our initial thoughts would be to go back to the beginning. And we begin by saying, well, I was born in this place. Well, certainly, if you want to know God's story, if you want to know God's story, then we must go back to the beginning. All the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. It is the beginning of a story that defines life and existence as we know it. Life and existence at its very core. The first three chapters of Genesis answers questions which mankind has contemplated throughout the ages. And while often controversial, I believe it provides the only truth about life. These three chapters of Genesis provides the framework for everything else that follows. It is God's story told by the only one who could really tell it, God himself. So we journey through the beginning, and in doing so we learn why and how we are where we are today. I've divided this story into five parts. <coughs> the creation, the plan, the fall, the redemption, and then back to the beginning. And so we start with the creation. And it is obvious that you cannot have a creation without a creator. And so the very essence of this entire story is found in the first four words of Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God. If you cannot accept and believe these four words, then all the words that follow, and all the remaining books and chapters of the Bible, will mean little to you. For everything else that follows in this entire God's Word, inches on these first four words. It establishes a beginning, and in that beginning, only God existed. Now I have a word of advice for you right from the beginning. Don't try to rationalize or in some way understand what it all means. It is futile to think that our human minds could even comprehend the first four words of Genesis 1 along the entire Bible. If you are not willing to believe by faith, you will never believe by understanding. Psalm 147 and 5 says, Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. But ours do. But ours do. And God in his wisdom didn't try to explain everything to us. But instead he told us the way that it is. And then enabled us to have the faith to believe it. Hebrews 11 and 3. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. You will never believe Jonah was swallowed by a whale if you can't believe that God made the whale. And so, having established God's existence, the remaining words of verse 1 defines him as the creator of the heavens and the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And so it began. And then the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day. And finally, we read, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. 
Psalm 24 and 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Isaiah 40 and 28. Do you not know? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. The creation. Brilliant and awesome and beautiful. And what other, whatever other words you can come up to try to describe it. And I have been fortunate to have seen much of it. But it's still the creation. And Miss Florence has it right in her testimony. It is still all about God. It is still all about the Creator. And we must never confuse the two and in any way give glory to the creation that is ultimately God's. It's still all about God. And so this leads us to the second part of God's story. God's plan. Genesis 1 and 9. And God saw that it was good. 1 and 12. And God saw that it was good. 1 and 18. And God saw that it was good. Chapter 1 verse 21. And God saw that it was good. Verse 25. And God saw that it was good. Good. After each day of creation, God stopped, looked back, and marveled at his work and said, Good job. Then we come to verse 27. Verse 27. And pay particular attention. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then we read in verse 31. God saw it was very good. Did you pick up on that? What was good in the first five days of creation became very good when the most important part of creation came to be. You and I. The first five days of God's creation were all designed towards the sixth day. And it was on this day his plan came to fulfillment. And as we read in the beginning chapters of Genesis, we see three aspects of God's plan. First, we see dominion. Chapter 1, verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. The first five days of God's creation were designed for one main purpose, for mankind. God created man to have dominion over his creation. He blessed them and then said, here's my plan. This is all yours. Be fruitful and increase in number so that all generations to come, all generations can enjoy and over, have control over everything that I have created. God said to Adam and Eve, this is all yours, <coughs> yours to enjoy, but also yours to be responsible for. God put us in charge of his entire creation. Now, environmentalists would say we have not done a very good job. What was a perfect creation has turned into a world that is flawed in many senses of the word. But until God says, I am taking it back, it is still ours. It is still ours to rule over. We are still in charge. We still have dominion over his creation, and we still make choices of how we rule over it. Let me tell you a story that happened many years ago. Wendy and I were camping in a park in Pasadena on the west coast of Newfoundland with our son Adam 
It was about five years old at the time. Now, Adam, like I guess a lot of little boys, loved playing with dinkies. And in particular, he loved playing with the little construction vehicles and the trucks and the back loads and the front end loaders. And I guess over a period of time, we had bought him a full box full of, of these little dinkies. And so one morning, I went outside in our campground and I cleared a place in the campsite and using little pieces of twigs and little pieces of wood, whatever I could find around, I built him what I would describe as a little town that he could use to play with all his vehicles. And I spent hours making roadways in the clay and building little bridges and building little uh, buildings and that. And when I was finished, you know, I was so proud over what I had made for him. So Adam was still inside our camper, so I went in and, in and I said, Adam, come out, I want to show you what I've done for you. So I brought him out and I showed him, I said, now this is yours. This is all yours to play with. And you can use your uh, trucks and your cars and you can play with this that I've made you. And so I began, I began to watch him as he started to play and then I moved on to something else. And I came back in a little while only to discover that he had everything destroyed. He had everything destroyed. He had basically trampled over it. And all my work and my best intentions were gone. Well, I have to admit that I had just about flipped. And I let him know what I thought about what the had done. And by now, Wendy's on the scene and she's wondering what's going on. What is he after doing? And I said, look what he did to what I had made for him. Look what he did. And when he looked at me, she said, Bruce, do you not know that he's just a five-year-old little guy? Well, you know, I really didn't care that he was a five-year-old little boy. I was more interested in what I had done for him and what I had given him and what he had done with it. I can't imagine how God must feel when he looks at his creation, what he made for us, what he gave us, and what we have done with it. Now maybe Adam being a five-year-old little boy, maybe he could use that as an excuse for what he did. But what excuse do we have as a society for the way that we have treated God's creation? We have no excuse. And as a society, it is just indicative of our greed and arrogance and lack of respect for God's creation. And it has led to things and words that years ago we never were taught of, like global warming and all kinds and sorts of different pollutions and the irreversible damage that many say that we have done to God's creation, the earth, the place that he has given us. And we can hardly turn on our TVs without hearing something else about how we are destroying this home that God has prepared for us. The second part of God's plan, freedom. Freedom. Chapter 2 and verse 16 says, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat. This must be one of the greatest decisions God had to make. Knowing how things would eventually turn out, God, still in his wisdom and his sovereignty, still chose to give us freedom. The freedom, as we just talked about, that allows us to abuse the earth if we so desire. The freedom to make our own choices, no matter how wrong they may be, and no matter how much they may separate us from God our Creator. Now in this beautiful garden that God created, there were probably countless number of trees. Maybe there were too many for us to even count. And Adam and Eve had full reign over the entire garden, over all the trees were there, except God said, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One tree. The rest are all yours. Only one 
only one can you eat from. Now, my question is, why didn't God somehow hide that tree? Why didn't God somehow put a, a boundary around that tree so Adam and Eve couldn't get at it? Why couldn't he have set some kind of a flame around it that would have prevented uh, them from being able to reach that tree? But he didn't. And it was out of respect for the freedom that he gave us that he didn't. The freedom that God gave mankind was a true freedom in every sense of the word. It was a freedom that allowed us to make the most pivotal choices available to us. We could obey God or we could disobey God. We could love God or hate God. We could serve Him or we could abandon Him. We could believe in God as Creator or not even believe that He even exists. Just as much as He gave us dominion over His creation, he also gave us freedom over the creation and over all the choices that we would make. Why such freedom? Why such freedom? Because he loved us and wanted us to return that love voluntarily. Voluntarily. I'm not ordering you to love me, God says. I'm asking you to love me. I'm asking you to love me. <coughs> of God's plan, relationship. Relationship. Chapter 3, verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the air in the cool of the day. I see this as one of the most beautiful verses in the entire Bible. It establishes for us God's desire to add a relationship with his creation, mankind. Eugene Peterson, in his message translation of this verse, phrases it this way. When they heard the sound of God strolling in the garden in the evening breeze. Isn't that beautiful? When they heard the sound of God strolling in the garden in the evening breeze. It would appear that this was uh, nothing out of the ordinary, that God regularly visited Adam and Eve. Now, we don't really understand how God made himself manifest, but somehow we did. Somehow they could sense his presence so real. Somehow they knew that he was strolling through the garden in the evening breeze. Now, it is a popular belief today amongst many that while God may have been creator, he quickly distanced himself from his creation. In other words, some believe God created all this. They have no issue with that. I believe God created the heavens and the earth. But they believe that he is no longer involved in the affairs of mankind. That we are on our own. That God doesn't intervene. However, this is certainly not scriptural. As right from the beginning, we see God's desire to play an integral part in the lives of his people. So much so that he gave us his Holy Spirit to actually live within us. So much so that we read in Romans 8 and 34 that Jesus is at the right hand of God interceding for us. The most important part of God's plan in all creation is that he would have a relationship with us. That he would have a relationship with us. That's what it was all about. That's what it was all about. God's plan comes down to a relationship with his people. And nothing has ever changed. Nothing has ever changed from the beginning, from the Garden of Eden, to this very evening in this very place. God desires to have Nothing more than a relationship with his people. A final word about God's plan from Psalm 33 and 11. But the Lord's plan stands forever. His intention can never be shaken. And so just like his plan was back in the Garden of Eden, we still know. And Jeremiah 29 and 11 tells us, 
For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. The creation, God's plan, and the third part of God's story, we see the fall. The fall. If I were to uh, ask you to tell me your story, no old bird, tell me all of it, tell me the good with the bad, then all of us would have something in our stories that we would refer to as being negative or not so good. That's something that we might say, well, if I could go back and change something in my life, I, I, I guess I'd like to change this, or I'd like to change that aspect, or I'd like to change that part of my life. In God's story, something happened that broke the heart of God. Something happened that forever changed the entire course of history. Now, we don't know how long Adam and Eve lived in perfect harmony in the Garden of Eden before this life-changing event took place. We don't know how long they lived in a divine and an unbroken relationship with God. Was this Satan's first visit to them? Or was this something that regularly happened? Had Satan been there before? Had he tempted them before? And while we don't know the answer to these questions, we do know two things. First of all, we know that original existence was perfect. In the beginning, there was no sin. In the beginning, Adam and Eve knew and did no wrong. In the beginning, the relationship between God and mankind was perfect, unbroken. And it was exactly as God intended it to be. But secondly, we know that all that changed, all that changed, in a moment of time, sin entered the world. Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and that once perfect relationship with their Creator was destroyed. Mankind had fallen. And if there is such a thing as the worst verse in the Bible, then Genesis 3 and 6 must rank amongst the top. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he hated it. With one bite, their lives and every life to follow was changed. There is perhaps no other single event in history that affected the world so much as this one. From a perfect relationship with their creator to a flawed relationship. From a perfect existence within the Garden of Eden to a flawed existence outside the Garden. From a perfect life, flawed forever because of their disobedience. And so, if you ask Adam and Eve their story, and if they could go back and do it all over again, I wonder what would they tell you they would do this. But it doesn't work that way, does it? Believe me, I know. But I also know that there is nothing, no matter how bad that happens in our lives, that God can't eventually work out for his and our good. And that brings us to part four, the redemption. While we have all done things that we regret, Nothing we have done or can ever do is beyond God's ability to forgive or make new and use for his purpose. And that applies to that fateful day in the Garden of Eden we call the fall of mankind. Genesis 3 and 15. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. How tragic it would have been if God's story had ended with the fall. But it didn't. The glorious creation that was seemingly deemed to destruction was not. 
But what if God's plan of giving mankind freedom resulted in a broken relationship that could never have been fixed, that could have never been restored? But it wasn't. And quickly God set the record straight. Knowing what was about to happen in the Garden of Eden that day, God from the beginning, God from the beginning planned the means of redemption for his children. And in this verse that I read earlier, we see reference to a fallen humanity and the continual warfare between grace and corruption in the hearts of God's people. Jesus, God's son, would be born an offspring to a woman. And the significance of this is supported in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, referring to Jesus, shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who owns the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. The words you will strike his heel, referring to the suffering and death of Jesus, but God says to Satan, he will strike your head, referring to the ultimate victory of Jesus and the ultimate judgment and destruction of Satan. In the beginning, there was grace and there was mercy. In the beginning, there was a way provided for mankind to be redeemed. And the good news about this redemption is that it is available to everyone. God redeems us. Through the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ, he redeems us. But God goes a step further. God goes even a step further. And God takes our brokenness, and he takes our mistakes, he takes our sin, and he takes the mess that sometimes we make in our lives, and God makes something good from it. And God makes something good from it. Let me tell you a, a personal story about how God can do this. It's close to 30 years ago now that I worked as the office manager of a wholesale grocery company in Carabinier. And I had just gone through a difficult divorce, and I was going through a time in my life when I was just messed up. When I was just messed up, I had no spiritual relationship with God, no idea what direction my life was going. And one day a gentleman came into my office, and he had a little piece of paper. And he gave me that little piece of paper, and he said, there's three names there. The local trade school, as we call it back then, or today I think it's called Coma, had called and said, if you're looking for some workers for your office, we suggest these three people who are just graduating now from our school. I took the piece of paper, but I also knew that in my filing cabinet, there was a file with probably, literally hundreds of applications for people looking for work. And so I said, what do I need this little piece of paper for? I've got all these names of people who applied, and I took the little piece of paper and I threw it in my garbage. It was later that day that for some, at the time, unexplainable reason, I felt the need to try to find that little piece of paper and to take it out of the garbage. And I can still remember almost 30 years ago, going through my garbage, looking for that little piece of paper with those names on it. And I found it, and I tucked it underneath my desk. That's all I thought about. It. it was some weeks later that some things in our office changed, and a lady uh, in charge of a certain department came to me and we decided that we needed to hire a person for the office. <coughs> and so I remembered that little piece of paper tucked under my desk pad. And I gave it to her and I said, look, there's three names on that piece of paper. I want you to interview those three people, pick the one that you think is the best, and then I'll interview that one person. And that's exactly what we did. And as a result, we hired a person, one of those three names on that piece of paper. 
I don't know if you figured out where I'm going with this, but that name on that piece of paper that I retrieved from my garbage became a very important part of my life. In fact, she is sitting behind me tonight. One of those names on that piece of paper was Wendy Shaler. She eventually became Wendy Sparks, my wife now of 26 years. Now, I do believe that sometimes in life, coincidences just happen. But I also believe that there are times when God works in our lives and leads us to do things which is part of his master plan to work in something good for us. No matter what you have done in your life, God is willing and God is able to forgive, redeem, and make new. New hope, new joys, new things that you may never have dreamed was possible. It's almost 30 years ago now that I retrieved that tiny piece of paper from my garbage. And I absolutely believe that it was part of God's plan for my life. God works in mysterious ways. Sometimes it's on little pieces of paper that we've thrown away and God subtly tells us that little piece of paper is part of my divine plan for your life. You may not know it now, but I suggest you go through your garbage and you find that piece of paper. Finally, we go back to the beginning. Back to the beginning. The first three chapters of Genesis sets for us the plot of God's story. It details for us, through a sequence of events, the storyline which will continue for generations after. The events that occurred in these chapters establish the future for all mankind. While it detailed his fall, it also detailed his redemption. Will we ever experience anything like those perfect days in the Garden of Eden? Will our perfect relationship with God ever be restored? Will we ever experience the sound of the Lord God walking through the garden in the cool of the day? Well, the Bible gives, gives us a clear picture into a future that restores things to perfection, much as it was in the beginning. 2 Peter 3 and 13 says, We are looking forward to a new heaven and a new the own of righteousness. Revelation 21 and 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Through a series of events beginning with what we often refer to as the end times, God will create something new and something wonderful. The end times will actually be the beginning of new times. I can only imagine what it would have been like living back in the Garden of Eden before man's fall. Time has passed, and we will never be able to go back to that exact circumstance, those exact set of events. However, we can experience what it will be like to live in a new creation, an eternal existence in perfect harmony with God. We learn from God's story. We understand his desire for us to be part of a new story. As we have journeyed back to the beginning, some may need to start afresh in restoring their relationship with God. The freedom he has given us enables us to make a choice in the matter. And the question is, will you make the right choice? When God created Adam and Eve, they were without sin, perfect. When we accept Jesus as our Savior, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 tells us, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And as a new creation, we are redeemed from our sins. We have a new beginning. God's story. God's story from the beginning to the... Well, it's not to the end, is it? It's not to the end because God's story will have no end. 
It is an eternal story. And if we make the right choice, our story will be an eternal story as well. Of course, is creator come create in you.